and sorry for you having to put up with me again. I was one of those people that Russ talked about earlier where I was just tra trolling along in Lake Hume and I, I snagged a, a nice trout a couple of years back. <laughs> no, it's true. And I didn't gaff it, it actually had a little lesion on it. <laughs> All right, so as Anthony said, I'm going to talk about um, some, some work that we did. And the aim of this component was to determine how river trout respond to annual fluctuations in water temperatures. So it was to find out if they're moving, if they're staying, or do they die if the water temperatures get too high. So if they are moving, where are they going? Are they going downstream to find um, a refuge pool or or most of our rivers run into lakes, so it's a lake such as Lake Gildon, or are they moving up into the cooler water waters in the forested areas? So how are we going to do this? So we're going to, we, what we did is we used some acoustic tags. So the acoustic tags, you've seen some photos before, they're only, you know, so big. We um, put them, surgically implant them into the trout, and I'll have some photos of, of how we did that later. And those tags transmit a unique si signal. That signal comes through to a receiver, which we've strategically placed in stream um, throughout, throughout the river. And so, that, so every time a fish swims within 200 or 300 metres of this, it puts out that signal, the receiver picks it up, records that particular fish and puts a date timestamp as well. So we know to the second what time that fish went past this receiver in the river. And, and these are known as acoustic tags. Other people, you can use radio tags, but for this, this is the, most, the easiest method that we thought for this project. So we put nine acoustic receivers in stream. So they started up at Mirambar, which is pretty well in the forested area, and put them throughout the river down. And the, the second last one was where the lake backed up to the Delatite River. And then we put one in the lake to find out if, if any were moving into the lake. At seven of these, we also put water temperature loggers, and they recorded the water temperature on an hourly interval. So it gave us good in-stream water temperature, but also gave us a daily variation as well. So this study is undertaken in the Delatite River. As I said, Mount Bull is up the top here. Logger Station 1 was up at Mirimba. Move our way down, there's a couple above Merrijig. The Mansfield water supply offtake is in between these two loggers here. There was a little bit of a barrier there. We weren't sure if they would impact trout or not. So we thought, well, let's put a logger each side to, to find out. As you came down, Delatite Lane, below the Mansfield Jemison Road, as I said, one that was the lake height at the time and one in the lake itself, and that's Lake, lake Yildon. These black bars represent areas that we actually fish chasing the trout. There was a lot more areas down this lower section, but I didn't put them on because we didn't actually catch any trout in those areas. So the black bar bars are areas we fished where we actually caught, caught brown trout. And this, this study was just on brown trout. They're all wild brown trout and they didn't include any rainbow trout. So how did we do it? We used the electrofishing method again. So we caught 100 brown trout in October and November last year. When we captured the fish, we anaesthetised them, measured them for length, weighed them and tagged them. So that was um, surgically it placed the tag and stitched them up and also gave an external T-bar tag for if an angler caught one, they could record it. The fish range from 20 centimetres to 57 centimetres fork length, or 100 to nearly 1.9 kilo. The size of the fish determines the size of the tag you use. You can't put too big of a tag into a smaller fish because there's a, there's a um, weight of the tag ratio to the weight of the fish. So we had to make sure we, sp we spread them right. We actually surveyed 22 kilometres of river targeting those appropriate size fish. So we, we knew we needed certain size fish, including a number of larger fish, to try and get, get the right response that we're looking for. So 30 smaller fish got the smaller tags. 
as you're aware, right up the top, they would have been easy to catch, but we want to place them throughout the whole stretch that we surveyed. <coughs> 40 medium sized fish were tagged, and they had a medium sized tag. I must say that the smaller fish, they ran out, they, they've expired, their battery life doesn't last as long. That's one of the side effects of the smaller transmitter, the battery doesn't last as long. And then we got 30 larger fish, and the larger fish had larger tags, but we, within the tags you can get a, a power setting, and that's on how far it will transmit through the water. The larger fish, we got a bigger power, because we predicted they're the ones more likely to move, and in case they're the ones that moved into the lake, so that one in the lake could pick them up, because it, because it was in the lake, they can swim everywhere, and it was four or five hundred metres wide, so we're hoping they had four hundred metres of redrange. But because of they've got the bigger power, it drains the battery quicker, so they actually run out <coughs> December, January this year. And the medium fish will go right through this summer. So we've still got 40 fish, which is quite a few, that will go through to next May. So tagging the fish, once we caught them, we, um, as I said, we knocked them out with an anaesthetic. We've had veterinary training to do this. So we give them a, a swab with betadine, so it's not blood. Um, we do a little incision. We get the transmitter put into the stomach, we start stitching it up, we recover it in water, and then the final stage is we let it go. So where did we tag these fish? I thought I'd add this one in. The black lines, as I said earlier, indicate where we surveyed. Right up the top we could have caught a lot more fish and there wasn't much of an intensive effort there, but most of the fish were smaller. Section through here where we fished quite heavily, and now, as I said earlier, there's, I won't tell you where, but there's a patch in there somewhere where most of those real big fish came from. So out of the 40 fish, 20 would have come from, you know, a four or five kilometre stretch of stream. And down lower, the, the, the river kept on going down there, but we just didn't pick up any fish. So what did we find? The water temperature, well, it increased as soon as out of the forested area. So if you remember the slide I showed there, Mirambar was the top one. It peaked at 23 degrees, had a variation of 7 degrees, which, which that's all right for trout. They start stressing you know, below that, but they can handle that, no worries. And don't forget that was the peak, not the average for the day. So most of the time with that variation, they're well within their range. However, once you come out of this forested area, there's Mirambar, you're right on the edge of where the forest is. It's on the northern side, which tells you because the sun goes that way, it still, still should have stream shading through this stretch here it jumped up to nearly 28 degrees. So that surprised us, and it nearly varied at 10 degrees a day. So a bit surprised about how quick it warmed up once it got out of that forested area. And that's, a, that's only within a, a 10 kilometre range. And just for reference, we thought it would get a lot higher down at Mansfield, Jemison Road, that was where logger number seven was. Um, you know, it only peaked just over a degree higher than as soon as the other forest area, although, it had much less variation, so the average temperature there was warmer once you got down lower. And this was during a mild summer. As we don't have any pre-existing water temperature data for this river before we put our temperature loggers in, I've used Mount Buller, which is where the headwaters of this stream come from, the number of days greater than 25 degrees. So it was mentioned earlier that two th summer 2013-14 was horrendous. It's the highest number of days above 25 degrees on, on, since mid-80s. Last year when we did this, not one single day went over 25 degrees. So that water temperature jumped up that high, that fast, in a mild year. I don't want to say it, but maybe we'll have a hotter year this year and we'll, we'll find you know, some more interesting results and we'll go into that later. Okay, so in general movement, and it, this is just analysing the summer data only, most of the fish didn't move. They were happy to be where they were. And they may have had small movements, but remember those loggers were a certain distance apart and a lot of fish were in between. But, but when I say they didn't move, most of them haven't moved one to two kilometres to be picked up by, by that receiver. One fish moved up during the Mansfield water supply offtake, so obviously it wasn't, wasn't a barrier. <coughs> and we analysed the data on a 60-minute time-defined move. So what that means is if it was picked up at a receiver and there was at least 60 minutes in between when it was picked up again, we said that fish is moving around. 
If it was picked up at that receiver and picked up a minute later, that fish is, or continuously for the next 20 minutes, that fish is staying in that area, it's sitting there, it's, it's, not, it's not moving. And that time-defined move took into account, when, when we ran the analysis, bioprecision ran an analysis, it took into account those non-moves at well, so they're an important component of, of the model we used. So as I said, there's a biometrician there. I use models to investigate the relationship between the fish that moved and the water attributes, and the fish that didn't move, I should say, and the water attributes were lower, water level and temperature and the fish length. We could have used fish weight, but we did the length weight relationship, and there's a pretty, pretty good <coughs> relationship, so we just worried about length rather than fish weight. What did we find? Larger fish were more likely to move. Didn't surprise us, they got more energy. But fish moving also increased with water level increase. So if you had a big rain event in the summertime, they're more likely to move around. And fish movement and temperature is pretty complex, but we've got here, you can see here, there's a spike around 18 degrees. 18, 19 degrees is in the literature is when trout become stressed. So around that 18 degrees, there's something going on that's triggering them to start moving. Once we got above 23 degrees, that's when the, most of the fish were likely to take off. So fish that were recorded on multiple receivers, there was only seven. So you've got to be a bit cautious with the results. One fish was down lower in the system, moved early. But six of the fish moved within a week of each other. And that moved between receivers two and three. And if you remember earlier, Three is just above Merijig, so they've gone past receiver two is the start of the forested area. So they've moved up, up into that forested area. So we used models to investigate the same relationship of the size of the fish with the water <coughs> level attributes. And again, for that long distance movement, as the temperature increased, the fish were more likely to move. This is the, the water temperature raw data of hourly readings for site two, so right at that edge of that forested area. And you can see this, a bit hard to read, I'm sorry, I should have put an overlay on that, but that is early January. We've got that peak temperature increase in early January during that mild summer. And then the temperature dropped quite dramatically after a rainfall event. And because it was a mild summer, it didn't really peak as much as what we did normally we expect February, March, all of the temperature be up high. But in that mild year, that didn't happen. As I said, so that was a hot week in January. When did the fish move? That's when they moved. Correlated exactly with that hot week in, with that hot week in January. Up the top, I've got the dates, and rough, this is roughly correlates with these locations. That's the temperature, peaks up, comes down. So what, what happens is, it's moved up to there, so that, that, that's correlating with this date here. It's kept on going. And, and now we're, we're somewhere in here. A few days later, or up to a week later, so that's correlating the sitting here. He's, he's moved back down to the edge of the forested area. And once he did that, and this is, this is what five of those six fish did all this at the same time, once they did that, they flew home, back to where they came from, all within the day. So whatever triggered them to move back down, they did it fast, back to where they came from. And that correlates with that drop in temperature again. So even though not a lot of fish did it, there's something there for us to work on. And this is still going for another year. And if we do get a hotter year, as I said, there's still 70 fish out there now that we can trace, track these with, and 40 of them will go through this whole summer. We might get some more interesting patterns of, of more fish doing this or doing something different. They might go to the lake, who knows. So in summary, as I said, it was a mild year. Temperature increased really quickly, had a high daily variation once it was out of the forested area. Most fish didn't move. However, the larger fish were likely to move. Water temperature, increased flow and length were all determining on that smaller scale, less than two kilometre movement around, around an individual receiver. But that increase in temperature triggered that long distance movement from to 10 kilometres. Interestingly, no fish that moved up to receiver one, so they moved from downstream of Merijig 
up to the edge of the forest area past that, but they didn't go all the way up to Mirambo where the water temperature was still suitable for their conditions. So they found a threshold somewhere in that region where they stayed. When the water temperature became favourable again, they've moved back down with that. The fish that moved upstream when the temperature increased all moved back to their original location when the temperature returned. During that same period when those six fish made that movement, there was another six fish that moved from in between the loggers that might have been four kilometres from the closest logger, hit those loggers during that same week. So again, it's another indicator that that hot week triggered, triggered some more movement. What happens to the resident fish that are already in that area? There's, there's something that could happen there. There could be competition um, for food and habitat. They do, they come overcrowded in that area when they all push up into that area. So there's questions like that we can start looking at investigating. Will this pattern be consistent if we do get a hotter year this year? We'll find out. It's forecast to be a hot year. We had a hot start to the year. The rivers are low, temperatures are increasing. So it looks promising that we may get a result. In the hot year, will they move downstream? Will fish start moving into the lake, into Lake Yildon? We also downloaded the loggers or receivers in October. I haven't analysed this data fully, but eyeballing the data, Larger fish were still more likely to move. A couple of fish moved downstream past that Mansfield water supply offtake. And July seemed to be a pretty consistent month where we had five fish move down in July. And I haven't looked at if there was any temperature correlation with that, but three of them were on the same day. So there's something in July that triggered a move downstream. Will those fish move up? We'll find out next time we download the loggers. As, as the water temperatures increase. What you saw mean? We know brown, towns, brown trout stop growing if water temperatures get hotter than 19 degrees. As you can see within this, there's lots of areas of, that, of these rivers that are above 19 degrees. They're at great risk of dying if it gets hotter than 24, 25. We saw that there was a lot of the area had peak temperatures above that, not the average. How resilient are they? How long can they hang on in those super hot years? I'm, we're thinking that the population will expand and, and contract within the river system. So if we get a run of years like the Millennium Drought, they'll push up into the cooler waters. If you get favourable conditions again, they're more than likely to, to spread back out through a larger area of river. Some research in New Zealand found that most of their fish, that, when they did an acoustic tracking study, moved less than a kilometre with, with little movement in the summer, and they were living in relatively deep pools. So this year during the summer, in some of those areas where the fish didn't move, we want to go see if there is some refuge habitat out there where the oxygen is still OK and it's still a bit cooler in these deep pools. And under climate change scenario, what's the future of trout in the lower sections of some of those streams? And you can spread this across Victoria, Tasmania, New South Wales, wherever. So what's next? As I said, we've still got 30 transmitters that run out January this year, another 40 go through the whole summer. We can analyse this winter data, look at that correlation of that July movement, see if it's related to any spawning events. Um, I mentioned earlier the fish that went down, will they come back up? So there's lots of questions like that we can ask, but I could go on for another five minutes. So I'd, I'd like to thank some people within this study, and particularly Andrew and John for a lot of field work. Andrew was the chief surgeon for this project, and there's lots of people from Mara that helped out. Mansfield Angling Club volunteers came out and helped carry buckets for a couple of days. That was appreciated. Fisheries Victoria staff and Pinky is here somewhere, John, for helping organise a lot of private landowners. Thank you. Authorised by Victorian Government, One Treasury Place, Melbourne.